Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I want to chat with you guys about different philosophies and styles in regards to homeschooling. So I know a lot of new viewers are coming and um, you're new to homeschool and you've never done this before and so you really haven't found like your niche and your groove yet with your homeschool style and I just want to tell you that that's okay. You know, homeschooling is not a one size fits all. Just because one of your friends does one style of homeschooling or someone in a co-op does one style, it doesn't mean that that's what you have to do in your family and with your kids. That's one of the reasons that a lot of us homeschool is like we want to tailor it to our kids, to their strengths, to their weaknesses, to their natural inclinations for learning. So um, I, what I wanna do today is just kind of outline and kind of give you a bird's eye view, if you will, of some of these, of the more common types and philosophies of homeschooling. If you're wanting more information, a quick Google search is gonna, you know, turn up a lot of information, but there are tons of books as well about all of these different methods. If you um, have a quick question, you can always um, drop the question below and I'd be happy to answer it or maybe even point you in um, the direction of some of the resources that I've used. So I'm outlining them and you're gonna see um, that we have homeschooled for seven years and we are getting ready to start our eighth year. And I'm gonna sh kind of share with you these different styles and philosophies, mainly because in one shape or form, I feel like we have morphed over the years in all, um, in our style and our philosophy. Like we started one way and we kind of morphed into another, into another, into another. So I'm going to share just a few general things that kind of uh, characterize the different methods and also kind of how it has shaped our own homeschool and how we used it and maybe how we um, morphed in and out of it. But before I even get into the different philosophies and styles, I want to point out that don't get hung up on calling yourself, you know, I'm only an unschooler or I'm only a classical or Charlotte Mason or whatever philosophy you guys predominantly use in your homeschool. You know, you're going to find that a lot of people are actually kind of, a, you know, a mix of maybe two to three different styles. And, you know, a lot of times if we say, well, I only homeschool a particular style, we could be missing out on some of these um, some of the great benefits of another style or philosophy by saying, well, I'm only sticking to this one particular one. They all have benefits. They all have some weaknesses as well, but we can kind of pick and choose. We can actually treat our homeschool more like a buffet and pick the things off from each one that we want. And honestly, you're going to find that near the end, I'm, I'm going to share, we are an eclectic homeschool. I pick and choose the things that I like about all the different methods and philosophies and and I make the Gandhi homeschool and I'm not a particular one anymore. Um, I think I probably started out that way, but over the years I've learned what works for my kids, what I like, what they like, and I have morphed it into our own unique homeschool. And you have the opportunity to do that for you and your kids as well. So let's go ahead and get started. And the first one that I want to share with you is like this philosophy of like, we're going to do school at home. And what do I mean by this is that it might be one of those curriculums that everything comes in a box and it's everything that you need and you're going to get it. You're going to open it up and you don't have to like pick and choose whatever it's got your words outlined of what you're going to say and just everything, all subjects, everything that you're going to need is all encompassed in this one box. And you're essentially doing what maybe a government school child is doing in your own home. So you're using the textbooks and the worksheets and the assignments and the tests and everything that that they would be doing in a government school is being done at home. It's just not in a classroom setting. You don't have another teacher. You don't have multiple different kids. You're just doing your one and only child. So poor little Gabriel, he was my first and this is unfortunately how I started. This was all that my husband and I knew. We both grew up in a government school and so that's what I knew. I had no previous experience with homeschooling. So we started to take one room at our home and we had the posters and we had the school desk and I had all the things to set it up and make it look like our own little school room. And maybe this works for you and that's totally fine. We just realized that over the course of the years, this didn't work for us. We were essentially trying to do way too many things. There was too much busy work. We were bogged down with everything. And you know, I think one of the reasons that we went with it is what, it was what we knew. And that makes it an easy 
method to choose because if that's your experience, it's easy to do that. But when we kind of stepped back and started to reflect on our own education, it was like, well, I don't really know history and can't really remember much about science. Um, didn't like this and I didn't like that. And it kind of made us reflect like, do, you know, if we don't feel like we learned a lot or retained a lot or didn't like school, why would we want this to be something that we are passing on to our kids? And so when we kind of had that realization, it was like we pumped the brakes and we started to make a little switch. And so that moves me to the next philosophy, which is the classical philosophy. And so when we kind of started our homeschool, we kind of started with more of a school at home and transitioned pretty quickly into the classical. And I know I've shared before that we have done classical conversations for seven years. Um, this is actually going to be the first year where we are not a part of a co-op because of our life change, right? We are getting ready to do um, go on the road. So we're not going to be a part of any co-ops um, that we have in the past. But um, the classical method really hinges on this idea that you are learning through this um, natural uh trivium and this trivium is broken up into three different stages and you have the grammar stage you have the dialectic and then you have the rhetoric stage so i want to kind of explain these different stages to you the first one being grammar and that's really you're talking about your elementary stage your elementary ages and so predominantly most of my kids for their entire time while we were in cc we were in the grammar stage at the very end gabriel started to move up into the next one but we were really focusing on this and this really is heavy on learning and um, gaining knowledge through memorization. Um, and it's really heavy on like history. We did Latin, math, science, English, geography, um, but it does a lot of memorization um, of different facts in all of those different subjects. And then you kind of naturally move into the next stage. So you move out of grammar and you out of the grammar stage and you are moving into the dialectic stage. And the dialectic, you're pretty much talking here about your middle school ages. And in this stage, you're really starting to try and understand, reason, question, all of those things that you have previously memorized in the grammar stage. You know, you're really trying to make sense of it. Like, okay, I memorize this, but what does it really mean? Like, um, and just asking questions about it. And I could really start to see that in Gabriel when he was questioning, you know, we were studying World War II and he would just ask questions like, okay, if, if the United States hadn't entered into World War II, do you think Hitler would have been stopped or do you think eventually he would have, you know, had his own fall? And so these were the kind of questions that he was bringing up and I'm thinking, we're, we're naturally moving into this stage. My younger kids are just memorizing these facts about the names and the dates and the places and the people, and they're memorizing them in songs, so it's really not seeming difficult for them. They're not trudging along. It was in a fun little song and they would memorize it easily. But then Gabriel took what we had memorized and he really started to think about the facts that he had memorized and start to question the things that we had learned about it. So he was just naturally progressing into that dialectic stage. Then naturally you move into the rhetoric stage. And this again is more of like your high school level if you're thinking of it in the terms of our natural education. And this stage is really about applying the knowledge that one you've learned, you've questioned, you've reasoned with it. This is about writing it and giving it in speeches and being able to speak authoritatively on those matters, maybe being able to even teach it to someone else. So you can just naturally see this progression of, of what you're doing with the information that you're given. And over the course of our time, I really did see that it really, it, it's, it's really following our natural tendency of how we learn. So um, a lot of times when I've tried to explain, you know, what we, how we did this, I try to give an example of, of learning with a guitar. Now, if I handed you a guitar and I said, play the guitar, and I need you to put your hand on this fret, and I need you to strum the chord G, you would look at me and be like, well, what's a fret? And uh, maybe I told you to put the capo on, on a certain friend. And you'd be like, well, what's a capo? And what's the chord? And how do I do it? So at this point, you really don't know the grammar, right? You don't know what capo means. You don't know what chord means. You don't know what fret means. So in order to learn how to play the guitar, you first have to start with the grammar. You have to learn what all of those different things mean and be able to kind of point them out to understand them. Okay, now I know what those things mean. Now what do I do it? Well, now I want you to move 
move from the grammar stage to the dialectic stage and I want you to strum a couple of chords in succession and I want you to move your hand from fret to fret and doing different things and now we're trying you know we're questioning it we're we're getting more familiar with the different parts of a guitar we're even starting to play it now as we move further on into the dialectic stage or I'm sorry the rhetoric stage you would actually be able to play a song with it. And that would be the natural progression of how you learn how to play guitar. Maybe even you would perform for someone or you could teach someone how to play. But it all started at the very basic where we had to learn all the parts of the guitar. We had to learn how to read music. Because if you don't know how to do those things in the beginning, you can't just go and start teaching it. So we have this natural tendency of learning this method in this method. So we really saw this play out with the kids and it really becomes that it's not so much about the information that we're learning, but we're really teaching our kids how to learn in this method. At least that's my take on it because we can all memorize some facts, but a lot of times those kind of disappear after a time, but it's teaching our kids um, different ways to learn things, different memorization techniques so that it's really not about the content that we're learning, but it's about being able to teach yourself how to learn. And when you can do that, you can learn anything. So we're really giving our kids the tools to be able to teach them anything that they want to teach themselves. So a lot of people will come at this philosophy and say it's very rigorous and it's very heavily focused on memorization. And I will say that it can be if you allow it. I will say that in our homeschool, we definitely did scale back from maybe the recommendations over the years. I really drilled Gabriel in the beginning and it's one of the biggest regrets because kids are naturally inclined to learn things very easily through very simple memorization. Um, if you look at how kids learn the ABCs, well, what do you do? You sing the ABC over and over again. If you want to be really good at shooting a free throw, what do you do? You do it over and over and over so that you can get that muscle memory to be able to do it. The same is true with this. You can do it too much. You could do it too little. You have to find what works for you, your kids, and your family. Okay, so I know I covered a lot about classical education because predominantly that has been a large focus of our homeschool, but now I want to transition into one that has more recently become a part of our homeschool school and that is the Charlotte Mason philosophy and I know I am not going to give it um, justice I know that Charlotte Mason um, the creator of this she wrote like several books about this method and so if you're wanting more um, information on this one go to the source herself like read her books but what I have pulled from this method is that it is a homeschool philosophy that is heavily relying on um, literature and reading and reading good books like good living books so we're not really focusing on textbooks in this we're not going to pull those in we're going to learn through reading good quality um, classic living books and a lot of it is where we're reading aloud to our kids and they're doing a lot of narration they're narrating back to them what they've heard what they learned and when they're younger it's not a lot of writing they're um doing their narrations vocally to you and then maybe when they get older it might reflect more in some writing about what they learned from the book that you read but it is a style that heavily focuses on great literature or a lot of people who also do uh, Charlotte Mason, they also are focusing on nature journaling, a lot of time outside, and also studying composers and artists and their famous works. So we have really um, implemented the Charlotte Mason style and approach into mostly, I would say, our science and our history, where I'm really trying to find good quality uh, living books that I can incorporate into our study. So we follow our CC guide as a um, as kind of to point us into what to study, but then I am finding different books that I can read aloud to the kids. Okay, so that's kind of like how we've incorporated Charlotte Mason. There is so much more to that. And again, I would direct you to go and read um, some books about the Charlotte Mason. We are just pretty new to that um, philosophy. So um, I'm just kind of sharing how we have incorporated it into our homeschool. Um, the next one that I want to talk about is unit studies. So a lot of people will use unit studies, meaning that they are going to kind of let the child decide based on their interests or desires of what they want to learn and allow their interests to dictate what they're learning about. 
And honestly, this is kind of a whole family thing. So the whole family is coming together. They're going to learn about one particular topic together, and it's really going to show how it is infused in all of these different things. And honestly, the topic could really be anything. The examples that I have of how we have used this method is when we went off and studied birds. And if you want to watch and see how I tied birds into everything, you can watch the video of how we like seriously birds just seeped into our life in every aspect. And I kind of shared how you can take basically that any theme and you can study all these different subjects with it. We are most recently doing that with cars. So what do I mean by that? I mean that all subjects that you're wanting to cover, math, science, history, geography, art, music, all of these different things, language, arts, your writing, whatever it is that you're wanting to incorporate into your homeschool could come together under a unified theme. So if you were studying cars, you know, you could write about Henry Ford. You could write about any any car maker or the history of all of the cars. That's bringing in your history. You want to do science? Well, let's figure out how fast um, a car can get to zero to sixty. Let's look at all of the acceleration and the stopping. And there's math and all of that. The horsepower. There's lots of things. Okay. Well, where are these cars made? Geography. Um, let's find some songs that talk about cars. You can really find a way to incorporate one theme and just see how it bleeds into all of these different subjects. I will say I was a little naive at the beginning thinking there's just no way, like it doesn't matter. You couldn't find a way to incorporate one theme into all of these different subjects. I was wrong because you totally can. It sometimes isn't as easy and it may not be as pretty as, you know, studying math out of a textbook or history. You know, it's not, maybe it's not going to cover into World War II or, you know, these main things that you're wanting to talk about, but there definitely is a way to incorporate these things into all of these different subjects. And it's really neat because I have found that my kids retain this information so much better because it is following their interests and things that they want to know about. So when you can really gear their education and get them like hyper focused on the subject, I'm telling you, they will retain that information and it will blow your mind. Okay, this is leading me into unschooling. So, you know, we kind of are going from unit studies where we're following the kids' interests and unschooling is just taking this maybe even a step further where this is really, a lot of times I think it gets a bad reputation because they're thinking unschooling is, is basically no schooling. And it's really not the case in the fact that it is following a child's interest and what they want to study, but the parents are not pushing anything on them. So they're not going to make them do a math curriculum, but let them to go and study anything. It's really allowing the child to follow their interest and study what they want when they want to study it. In this method, the parents aren't going to be pushing a math curriculum on them if all they want to go is grab their favorite book series and just devour the books one after another. Or maybe they're really into computer programming. Well, they're going to let their kid learn through the computer programming instead of pushing this math curriculum on them. It's really letting the kids follow their interests, but also kind of decide when they want to do it to allow, again, talking about when, when things are really important to someone, they are more apt to try harder and they're more apt to retain it. So if you are trying to push something on your child that they're really not interested in, the theory goes, that they, they may not retain it as well. But if you wait for your child to get that interest, then they will dive into it and put all, like their 110% into it to be able to learn it. Now I have an example that I had heard from an unschooling family where they were talking about they really didn't push a math curriculum on their kids. And they were in high school and they still really hadn't done any formal um, math curriculum. Now they knew how to do their their math and they, they by no means were unintelligent. They had just decided to follow suit in separate areas that maybe weren't following a true um, curriculum. So when the child was, when this boy was um, in high school and deciding, you know what? I really think that I want to go to college and he might have been a junior or a senior and his parents kind of sat down and said that's that's fine we we are happy for you to go to college but you know what colleges expect you to be able to have I think it was like algebra or geometry but it was it was a couple of basic math courses that he had not done 
And so, you know, if you are wanting to go into college, you're going to have to, you know, learn these things because that's what's expected. They need to see that on your transcript, transcripts, and they are also going to expect you to know that. So what this boy did is they got him the curriculum because he decided that it was important to him and he wanted to learn it because he wanted to go to college. He saw the value in it. And in two to three months, he had conquered algebra and geometry because he poured himself into it. And that was what he had deemed as being necessary for him to take the next step in his own education. And so because of that, he, he knocked it out in a very short time frame. And that really just blew my mind because those are the same thoughts and questions that have been going through my mind when, when I've thought of this idea of unschooling. You know, a lot of people are going to say that, of course, this could leave gaps, but any education does. So it's really about, again, teaching your kids how to learn something when they want to learn it. If you guys can teach your kids how to learn something, it doesn't matter what they're learning. You're giving them to the tools to be able to learn anything that they come across. All right, this unschooling idea is kind of leading me to this last idea of road, road schooling. And this is where uh, it's very common for traveling families and it's really about experiencing your education through like all of your senses, through seeing things, touching them, smelling them, eating them, you know, traveling around and really experiencing the things that you're learning about. And it's also really about us using your location about what you're studying. So if you are studying the Civil War, maybe you're going to visit Fort Sumter, or maybe you're gonna visit Gettysburg or all these different Civil War sites. If you're learning about Thomas Jefferson, maybe you're gonna visit Monticello. If you're learning about the Oregon Trail like we did, maybe you're gonna vi visit the Oregon Trail ruts or you're gonna go to Fort Laramie or Scott's Bluff or Chimney Rock, all of these things that would be along um, the Oregon Trail. So it's a lot of using your surroundings and all the places that you're traveling to really spur what you're teaching your kids about. Again, this has become a very common one for us as we have really found a love in traveling because I have, again, found that my kids, when they can actually, when we're maybe reading a book about the Oregon Trail, but then we go and we see the ruts and we see a, you know, replica of an Oregon Trail covered wagon, they're really starting to put like some thoughts together about like, wow, they really didn't just like drive out there because it, we can get out to, um, you know, Oregon in a couple of days driving, but it took months for them to get over. And you start looking out over the terrain and everything that they had to cross in order to get there. It really starts to put some perspective. They start asking some different questions and it's really like a super neat experience to be able to give them that opportunity to see these things firsthand as we're studying about them and not just necessarily looking at a picture in a book. Okay, lastly, this is leading me to eclectic. And as I hinted to in the beginning of the video, this is kind of where we have fallen as in our family. And this is really of just taking and looking at all these different philosophies as a buffet and saying, I'm gonna take this piece and this piece and this piece, and I'm going to morph from the favorite things, the best things that work for my kids, for our family, and I'm going to make our own method. There's no right, there's no wrong. And I, I have found a lot of joy in that because I think I was really putting myself in a box when I was trying to say, you know, we're going to be this kind of family or we're going to be this kind of family. And none of them were really working because I'd be like, but I really want to do a unit study about this. This would be really cool. Or, you know, I really like to travel this place. And while we're there, I think we should probably study it. But we're not really in the time in the right time frame. So I really found that this was what was working for our family and just being able to pick and choose and and not really having any guilt about it like you know you get to choose what works for you and your kids and your family as a whole and that is one of the things i absolutely love about homeschooling all right guys so i'm really curious about what philosophy you guys use in your own homeschool has it morphed or changed over the years i would love to know um what you guys find works for you and if you are finding that maybe you do treat it like a buffet where you're picking this and this and this from a couple of different methods to make your own unique and personal homeschool so of course this is not an exhaustive list for homeschooling so if you have a different method that you use i would love to hear about it and if you have any questions about any of the different different methods and philosophies that I mentioned, I would be happy to answer them or point you in a direction of a greater resource than maybe I can offer. And until next time, guys, have a blessed day.